All right, let's cut to the chase. This is the third draft of this video, and I am determined to not make this so convoluted this time. If you have to know, I've written about 20 pages of content about this topic, and I'm just not gonna cram any more of that into a video. So uh, today's video is about world building fantasy army. It'll be quite general, but that's also kind of a relative word today. The main focus here will be medieval style militaries and those that came relatively before. Of course, overall, if you're creating your own fantasy military, you can mix and match all kinds of concepts to create something unique and entirely your own. But understanding the basics of these types of armies will allow you to more effectively depict how they impact the story and narrative. So, here's how to world build a fantasy army for your fictional story. Number one, technology. The first thing to consider before creating the fictional military is the level of technology their society has developed. This can include anything from basic machinery, gunpowder, or magic. Technology used in a society will severely change many ways in which regular life operates, especially warfare. For example, the invention of flintlock muskets would result in more soldiers using firearms than swords and spears on the battlefield. If magic was readily available for every person to use, then magic might simply be the main weapon used in warfare, which is mostly the case in the world of Avatar. The same goes for technology. Will there be steel weapons and plate mail? or spiked clubs and cotton armor. Since we're only looking at militaries that use swords, shields, and spears today, we won't be talking too much about militaries that primarily rely on gunpowder. So in a fantasy army, even if your society is limited to swords and armor, there is still a nuance of development that separates a more advanced group from a lesser one. You would primarily see steel and iron weapons in medieval style forces, and the best warriors would be heavily armored cavalry, often called knights, but they could be cataphracts or samurai. Foot soldiers were often drawn from the common or lower classes, and depending on their level of skill and training, they could be outfitted with cheap spears and whatever gear they owned, or well armored and given a large variety of weapons. These types of armies would also have crossbows, which have high penetrative power, longbows, which can shoot a great distance, and regular bows, which are only really best against unarmored foes. Advanced versions of these armies would be capable of a lot of interesting engineering techniques. Castles were the primary method of defending and projecting power over a land. And so taking or destroying these castles was key to medieval warfare. The construction of siege engines, such as ballistas and catapults, are important to many of these armies and would be a standard expectation during a siege. In Game of Thrones, it always struck me as particularly odd that ballistas were being introduced as a counter to the dragons, and yet they treated these weapons as if no one had ever invented them before. That society is well advanced enough to know how to construct those things. It is one of many discrepancies that appear when a writer isn't thorough with their world building, especially because in A Song of Ice and Fire, siege engines were already a regular part of the world. But I digress. Technology for your world isn't a linear process either. When a kingdom or empire grows powerful enough, they'll develop high quality armor and weapons. This also applies to magic, doctrine, or other technologies. Like the Roman Empire, if this powerful nation falls, for example, the remnant people groups might still use some of the technology and advancements the empire had, but they might not be educated or wealthy enough to sustain or reproduce that technology. Not until they become prosperous enough again. Think of how the Legion, one of the most effective fighting forces in Europe, stopped being used because equipping and training a Legion eventually became unsustainable. But when nation states came about again, they started forming more regimented militaries once more. Number two, organization. It's important to remember that for a time, 
Most medieval armies were actually privately owned. They were the people who lived across land that was owned by a certain lord, and for living on his property, they were obliged to take up arms for him whenever he needed to defend the land. Standing professional armies which belonged to a kingdom were not developed until much later in time. Before then, the only professional warriors you'd see would be veterans who often served as mercenaries, or knights who were trained most of their lives for warfare. Both of these types of warriors could usually be part of a nobleman's retinue. Samurai too, in many ways, also functioned like knights. In medieval forces, soldiers were usually raised as levies or serving a lord as part of his retinue. It was the responsibility of the lord to equip, supply, and lead his own private army. He could have other lords who were loyal to him and in charge of their own armies, and his army would likely be loyal to the king of the land. So when a king called for war, he was essentially calling for all of these privately owned armies to assemble under his leadership. Otherwise, the king would only command the troops that he himself was paying for. Military units would often be organized at the start of a campaign, rather than being permanently assigned during times of peace. Common unit organizations you might use in your fantasy armies are the Banner, which could be a collection of retinues and levies for multiple regions that were assigned to fight together under a designated standard. You could use the company, which could vary in size and professionalism, but showed up as either part of a unit of regulars or as a mercenary unit in its own right, such as a free company. And then of course there is the retinue, which was essentially the bodyguards, professional soldiers, and companions of a knight, king, or lord. Other words you might use to describe military forces would be a host, a contingent, a detachment, a band, or a force. Organizing all of these types of units into a permanent brigade or regiment would not come about until after the medieval period. Standing armies don't exist until kingdoms grow prosperous and rich enough to permanently sustain them. Otherwise, they would simply be too expensive especially for rulers who preferred keeping their wealth for themselves or for other purposes. So keep that in mind if your kingdom has a permanent army. There needs to be a good reason why it can afford that or is willing to have that many people under arms at a time. Levies were essential to medieval style armies as they formed the bulk of the infantry. Poor levies would just be expected to bring whatever they owned to a battle while rich leaders were generally able to equip each soldier with basic equipment. A single noble might be placed in charge of a group of levies, and all of them could be grouped together by type when a battle begins. Archers from all groups could be placed together under the command of a noble or a great warrior. And infantry from all holdings would be massed together and given a leader in the same way as well. The same goes for other types of troops. Of course, these units can have several of their numbers detached from the main group at any time in order to complete separate objectives. It's important to remember that levies were usually only obligated to serve for a certain time period, and it was important for many medieval economies that levies be released in time for the harvest, otherwise the kingdom might starve. Having them raised for too long could create discontent but a good leader could offer continued pay and other incentives for the soldiers to remain. It might not even be the common soldiers demanding to be released, as the lords under a leader would recognize that it's their personal economies at risk while those soldiers are under arms. Of course, levies who remain in service too long may end up becoming regulars and professional soldiers themselves, which brings up the concept of mercenaries. Mercenaries are professional soldiers, or wannabe professionals, who will fight for a cause based on pay. Sometimes we might see them as individuals or small groups hired for a small task or to bolster the ranks of an army. Other times, they might be an entirely organized unit of veterans, often known as a free company. Keep in mind that these warriors serve based on a monetary contract, as opposed to a sworn oath. If that money runs out, they might abandon the war, they might change sides, or they might even just start looting the country that 
originally hired them. Number three, battle. Every army fights differently and has their own preferences and skills during warfare. Many times, technology and home terrain determine how an army fights. If a land has lots of wide open fields to be traversed, expect an army to field horses to better ride across that land. If a land has many trees of a certain type, such as ash or yew, they might use that high quality wood to make powerful bows. Swamps or the woodlands, like in Germania, allow for deadly guerrilla tactics to be perfected. A land with many castles could be masters of siege warfare and could be armies that generally don't expect to be fighting in the fields very long. And access to wealth and the open sea might allow for a large and powerful navy in a country. When two armies fight each other in battle, they often spend a few days or even months maneuvering around each other. You can expect smaller scouting parties to be looking for the enemy positions, and they might end up meeting an enemy group trying to do the same thing. Small patrols will also be going around looking for supplies and screening the advance of an army. Raiding and foraging were important before a battle, allowing for more supplies and for confusing and demoralizing the enemy. Both armies will be trying to look for an area that will suit their side best in the coming battle. But for one reason or another, the battle will have to be joined. Maybe the defending army is running out of supplies and can't sit on top of their good position forever. Maybe the attacking army needs to defeat the defenders so that they can finally carry on with their invasion plans. Of course, one side could surrender or withdraw, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the battle. And when both sides get ready to do the fighting, it'll depend heavily on the different cultures for how the battle begins and carries out. Some armies might offer a parlay at the start, or even a duel between champions. That parlay might end the battle there and then. And a duel can break the morale of one side while raising the morale of the other. They could even devolve into a small skirmish as great warriors come forward and join the fray one by one. Sometimes, these actions might even be a good ruse to stall for time, either to reposition troops in secret or to wait for the reinforcements. Armies on a battlefield would be divided between left, right, and center. An army's center would be its main line. Its left and right flanks would make it vulnerable to being surrounded if they were left unguarded. Enemies that could break through a flank could quickly turn the tide of a battle, so these flank positions were vital. Behind the army there is also room for a reserve line of troops that can be sent into the fray wherever they're needed. The commander in many early armies would be expected to fight at the front with their troops. As time went on and military strategy became more developed, Good commanders often chose to remain on a vantage point to direct the battle. They would only join the battle where fresh troops and morale were most needed, and only if no one else could do it. Armies could fight differently, depending on if they believed victory was easy, or if they believed it would be a hard battle. They often began with skirmishers being sent to harass the enemy lines, while everyone else would get into position. These would be archers, crossbowmen, slingers, or javelin throwers. Now, once the battle drew near enough, the skirmishers would retreat behind them. From then on in the battle, they could either rush in and join the fighting, or stay on the flanks and try to shoot at the enemy. Careless armies might even shoot into the melee, inflicting casualties on both sides. Heavy cavalry might lead the charge if they think their enemy will easily break but they might also stay on the flanks and try to get around the enemy instead if they know the opposing lines will hold their ground. Out of pride, they could even simply look for where the most elite of the enemy cavalry is and engage them in battle. Whether they are fighting at the center of a battle or at the flanks, it usually matters if the heavy cavalry wins or not. Ideally, if they won at the flanks, they could circle around the enemy line and charge them from the rear known as the hammer and anvil tactic. This would just about guarantee victory. Sometimes the cavalry might have other priorities though, 
such as chasing off their defeated enemy counterpart, or simply wanting to ride into the enemy camp to plunder. If the cavalry fights in the center and loses, well, they obviously couldn't break through, so that might mean the infantry will be stuck in a prolonged melee. The infantry would typically form into a battle line. If there are enough of them, they might form two or three different battle lines. Depending on the level of sophistication in the armies, these lines would either charge at each other recklessly, such as with barbarian armies, or they would march in a battle line and then clash once they got close. The least advanced armies would all fight in a massive melee where individual warriors went from one opponent to the next. Moderately trained and equipped armies would often fight in a shield wall or similar formation. They would hold together and slowly advance against the enemy line, sometimes even pushing against the enemy's opposing shield wall. These lines wouldn't always hold as different parts of the line shifted and buckled. Discipline was key. Things could easily devolve into a more chaotic melee if one side started to gain the edge. That usually happened at the deciding moment of a battle. The most advanced heavy infantry troops, such as Roman legions, could be expected to remain in a disciplined formation as they cut down enemy troops who crashed against their shields. Pikemen and halberdiers would tend to remain in thick formations, maximizing the damage they could do to attackers. Heavy infantry like this could be destroyed if they were outflanked, such as being attacked in the rear when the enemy cavalry defeated their own cavalry at the flanks. Reserves could either be the weakest troops of an army or the most elite. They were often placed to the rear. Their best uses would be to move in and cover a gap in the lines if it opened up, or to surround an enemy that has outflanked the main battle line. Obviously, an army would only have reserves if they had extra troops and nowhere else they needed to send them. A wise military commander would know how to utilize them and would always keep them on hand. Many battles took place over the course of a day or night, but if no conclusion was reached, some battles could take place for several days. Once one side began to win, most soldiers preferred to run away. Elite soldiers might make a last stand and fight to the death though. Depending on the culture, prisoners of high value could be treated relatively well and used for negotiation purposes or traded back for ransom. Of course, they might also simply be executed for any variety of reasons. Slavery was very common as well, especially in societies of classical antiquity. Plenty of people were wise enough though to know that killing high value prisoners could mean you get no mercy if you yourself were taken prisoner. Each war, culture, and circumstance might have different variables for the treatment of prisoners. Number four, fantasy. Let's talk about the fun part, making your fantasy military into a real fantasy military. For the world you create, this can have multiple ranges from low fantasy to high. There is so much that can go into a low fantasy military that can actually make it incredibly interesting. It all depends on the skill of the writer to depict the people involved, the practices of the force, and the events that transpire around it. But there is also so much that can be done with the more high fantasy military as well, and creating one can be very rewarding for your world or fiction. Obviously, the first fantasy element that could change an army would be magic. This would be heavily dependent on your world, but keep in mind that medieval armies and those before have always believed in some form of magic in one way or another. Painting crosses on your shields, having ancient relics carried by priests, performing sacrifices on altars before battle, wearing charms and talismans for protection, it was all believed to make a supernatural difference. You can take this lower form of magic and actually give it power in your stories. A higher amount of magic would be the type that is commonly found in high fantasy, that of the wizards and sorcerers and such. There would often be one or a few of these alongside a more conventional army. Their powers might allow them to do disastrous and powerful things on a battlefield, 
This could decide the entire course of battle, and would thus mean such magic users were people of high status and reputation. Logistics, weather, and scouting could all be changed drastically by magical means, and would play a large part in warfare. Think of how soul casting is used in the Stormlight Archives, or how the Everstorm was utilized before an invasion. Magic might also be a less powerful and more common thing. It might only be yet another weapon that could be used to deadly but only moderate effect. For some militaries, this might mean that the majority of the fighting still takes place by conventional means. But now, there is simply a new troop type involved. But also consider the type of military that would come into existence if magic was easily accessible to everyone. It might become the same as firearms, and could then take over as the primary method of warfare. In the Avatar world, not every soldier is a bender, but those who can bend elements make up the best and most prominent troops. Equate this with the idea of knights, who are deadly on the battlefield, as opposed to regular soldiers who can fight but will never feature as prominently. Competent generals and many normal warriors would make it a priority to figure out how to counter such magic. Perhaps there is a resource that magic can't affect, such as Dimeridium in The Witcher. Or perhaps magical beings are heavily neutralized with a simple alloy like iron. Perhaps other forms of magic, such as charms or wards, would prevent someone from being affected by spells. Maybe the advent of more deadly technologies, such as firearms, could change the dynamics of power. But if there is no true protection or counter, then maybe only another magic user or their willingness to take heavy losses would make regular people want to fight against a magic user. Of course, there can be more than just magic in a fantasy military as well. What about monsters and creatures? How do they factor into the world and how do they change a military? There is this line in Fantastic Beasts that was honestly an entire story in of itself. Newt's commander gets asked where he served during the Great War, and he responds that he participated on the Eastern Front, where he wrangled dragons. It's very vague, and I don't know what he means, but for some reason, all I could think of then was World War I Red Baron-esque dogfighting biplanes, except with dragons instead. Man, does that deserve to be a thing. Of course, he could also have meant that he was trying to keep dragons in that region under control because of the war, but honestly, I uh, think it'd be really cool to see squadrons of dogfighting dragons. Now, even in our own history, war elephants were commonly used in the military during classical antiquity. These were often seen as a monstrous and massive threat on the battlefield. Soldiers had to develop new techniques in order to counter elephants, and they drilled hard on the formations required to do so. Think to yourself, how would one army do battle against an enemy that utilized monsters, especially if they themselves didn't? How would a fantasy army fight against an entire army made up of creatures consisting of various sizes and anatomies? What would that battlefield look like? Because remember, soldiers cared a lot about surviving, and that means that they would have to be as ingenious as possible to adapt and try to overcome the obstacles that are thrown in their way. So they wouldn't just fight stupidly unless they had never seen these types of monsters before. And next, how might race add significantly to your military world building? What are the differences for another race of beings that would cause them to prefer one style of warfare or another? A pike or two-handed sword in the hands of a halfling might be the equivalent of a regular sword or spear in the hands of a human. The human variant would be too large and unwieldy, so for halflings, these troops wouldn't provide the same function on a battlefield as if they were human. Nor would troops using longbows, which for halflings wouldn't be the normal six foot that it would be for humans. Warfare for each different race would evolve based on their capabilities or their capacity to overcome those capabilities. If you create your own fantasy race, think of what unique ways they could fight on a battlefield. The Argonians of the Elder Scrolls series are lizard folk 
who are capable of living in uninhabitable swamplands. They can swim underwater and are incredibly stealthy. While they might be able to fight conventionally, they also have the ability to fight in mass in ways that humans couldn't normally fight. Imagine that one of your races might simply find it more suitable to spread disease and essentially use chemical warfare as a weapon, simply because it was more efficient and it didn't affect them. And if a race were mostly aquatic, their primary strategy might be to devastate the shipping lanes and ports of their enemy with lightning fast raids. How would a people group adapt in order to counter these things? What technology would they develop? Would they have any magic to help them with it? Lastly, how would gods and divine beings affect the battlefield? Would they be able to use magic to rain fire down upon the world? Could they take form and fight at the forefront of the battlefield? Would they be hiding among the soldiers and influencing the course of the war? They can be as active or passive in the world as you want. But if soldiers knew the gods were providing practical help, warfare might become heavily reliant upon them. Suddenly, holy days and prayers might be the high fantasy equivalent of calling in air support. If you have the gods be more of a mysterious sight on the battlefield, perhaps people might speak of them like spirits or myth. When they do appear, it would be a rare and almost surreal experience. And divine beings don't have to do any fighting themselves. Perhaps they raise up demigods or influence the lives of champions towards their own ends. There is so much that can be covered on this topic. Everything in this video only scratches the surface of what we can discuss when it comes to world building fantasy militaries. Understanding the organizational structure, realistic qualities, and fantasy elements can really enhance the kind of stories we are able to tell with fantasy militaries. Even if you don't write anything, just having the deep world building will create countless untold stories in of itself. I definitely plan to do more fantasy and sci-fi military world building videos in the future, so keep an eye out for those. What are the things that make your fantasy armies unique? Can a plain, low fantasy army be compelling? Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe. Thanks for watching.